The spatial frequency tool in MATLAB that we just explored hopefully has given you some intuition that we can think about plane waves as uh, Fourier transforms or through Fourier transforms. And that if we know the spatial frequency on a boundary, uh, let's say the X boundary we were looking at, that corresponds to a term of the wave vector, the KX term. Um, and since K is constrained to be equal overall in magnitude to two pi over the wavelength, if we know the KX term, we then know the KZ term, and we know the angle of propagation. Those concepts are fundamental to a class called Fourier optics, not surprisingly, but we need a little bit of that here, and that's why we're walking through this particular module. The reason we need it is we, we need to be able to uh, predict the light at the focus of a system in systems that are different than just Gaussian beams. We need arbitrary distributions of light. And it turns out the way to do that is these Fourier transforms. That's what Optic Studio does. And next we'll go look at how these terms and how these techniques look in Optic Studio. But we need to understand where the plots are coming from. So that's what this part of the class is about, is to bring Fourier concepts into our geometrical ray tracing class. And the relationship is that spatial frequency explorer, that the K vector can be thought of as our ray vector. And therefore, uh, on a boundary, the K vector corresponds to a spatial frequency, and now we have the Fourier concepts. So we're gonna walk through the key concepts out of a Fourier optics class that we need. Um, it's very powerful stuff. And to really understand diffraction uh, in greater detail, I encourage you to go look at that class. So let's think about a, uh, an imaging system. Um, actually, not an imaging system, a 1F, 1F system, um, uh, where we have a single lens. Um, and on the front boundary, uh, which is going to be the front focal plane, um, we're going to paint that same complex exponential drawn here through its real part uh, that we have in the Spatial Frequency Explorer. And remember uh, that if it's got a particular period, we'll call that lambda x, because it's in the x direction, um, we could relate that to a wave going in a particular direction, theta, uh, with a local uh, wavelength between the waves along the direction of propagation, lambda naught. One over wavelength is, is frequency, um, and so the spatial frequency is sine theta over lambda. Now let's walk through what we expect a spatial frequency on this front boundary to do when we get to the back boundary. And we don't really have the ray tracing tools for that. Well, it turns out we do, and we're going to go, we're going to go see those. So um, here is that plane wave that corresponds to that period on the boundary. It's just the same as my spatial frequency explorer that you played with last. It's got a vacuum wavelength, we're in, we're in vacuum here, uh, of lambda naught. It's going in a direction theta, and so notice my little dotted lines here that I have peaks of this wave along x that are separated by lambda x, and peaks of this wave along the direction of propagation separated by lambda, and the two of those through a little bit of trigonometry tells you that the direction of the wave is theta and the relationship is sine theta. So great, now we can take any arbitrary complex exponential on the boundary, uh, that, that's its uh, periodic function here, and we can relate that to the plane wave that must be propagating off towards the lens, and we know that then can be described in geometric, geometrical optics by a ray or a bunch of parallel rays, if you'd like. Awesome, that means those parallel rays hit the lens, and of course, they converge to a single point in the back focal plane here. That's simple graphical ray tracing. And a converging cone of rays corresponds uh, to a converging spherical wave. Awesome, we're all over that. And of course, the single ray I've traced here um, is our, our world's simplest, which is the one that goes through the center of the lens so that the angle theta here is the same as the angle theta here. Good so far, we're doing great. So in the geometrical approximation, where this comes to an infinitely sharp focus, uh, I have a delta function right here. 
Um, and the position uh, in the electric field, right? They got nothing, nothing, and all right here at the focus. Um, the position of that delta function uh, would be given by the focal length uh, times sine theta. Now, you might be thinking it should be tan theta, uh, and it actually is sine theta. That's a subtlety we'll get to in the third class. Turns out that lenses focus on the spheres, not on the planes. So, um, but in the practical approximation, it doesn't matter um, because uh, everything would be just theta, whether it's sine or tan. So I know the position of my focus, um, focal length times sine theta. Oh, hey, I know sine theta over here, so I could substitute. And the key result is right here, is that the position of this delta function is the focal length, the wavelength in this material, uh, times this spatial frequency, the one over here. That is important. Because now I can draw this picture. I have a sinusoid or complex exponential on this side with a particular spatial frequency, fx. On this side of the lens, one focal length behind it, I have a delta function. Complex exponential on this side, delta function on this side. It's a Fourier transform relationship. And conveniently, we find that the position of this delta function is linearly related to the spatial frequency of this sine wave. And the scale factor, because there has to be a scale factor, fx is in one over meters, and I don't know how to measure a distance in one over meters. So I'd better multiply by something with unity, uh, with quantities, quantities unit. I'd better multiply this by something that has the units distance squared, because I'm measuring a distance here in real space. There's one distance, second distance, oh, that makes sense. So there's a scale factor, focal length and free space wavelength. But after I remove that scale factor, what I have on the right-hand side is the Fourier transform of what I've been left on side. So this hasn't been a proof. You can prove this with Fresnel equations derived from the wave equation. But hopefully I've motivated the fact that if I have a lens and I paint an electric field on the front side, I find the Fourier transform of that electric field on the back side where the coordinate system here is scaled by f times the wavelength. That is called the Fourier transform geometry. There are others, but this is the, the kind of classic geometry. And we'll now use that to understand if we have an arbitrary field distribution on this side, what's the actual size and shape of the focus spot we find over here. So in summary, the optical system consisting of one f of propagation, propagation distance, a lens, and another f of propagation distance is a Fourier transform. We paint an electric field on the front plane here, x. It's got a spatial frequency, fx. We find on the back focal plane, x prime, a delta function, if we have a complex exponential over here, but in general, a Fourier transform. Um, the Fourier transform variable is one over distance, spatial frequency, and since this is in real space, there must be some sort of scale factor. There's the scale factor. So the black box system of this lens performs a Fourier transform of the electric field with this particular scaling. That's how we're going to take arbitrary fields into the front of a lens and understand what the actual shape and size of the focus is on the back of the lens.